Hello students, in this session we are going to learn about a romantic poet named John Kitts. He is one of the most successful poets in the romantic era. He was born on 31st of October 1795. When he was 8 years old, his father passed away and at the age of 14, his mother also passed away. These incidents in the family brought him very close to his brothers and sisters. And as a whole, the family has gone through a catastrophic happenings. John Kitts has contributed great poems to the field of English literature. And such a great personality passed away after a prolonged illness on 23rd of February 1821. Some of the famous works by John Kitts are Imitation, 1814, First Volume of Poems, 1817, Indimion, 1817, The Eve of St. Annes, 1819, La Belle Dame Sans Mercy, 1819, Ode to a Nightingale, 1819, Ode to Autumn, 1819, Ode to a Grecian Urn, 1820, and second volume of poems published in 1820. John Kitts' La Belle Dame Sans Mercy is a ballad. Ballad is a narrative poem written to be sung. And here in this poem, the poet has used the traditional ballad form. Thematically, it deals with three different themes. One, unreciprocated love. Two, impossible love. Three, incurable illness. These three themes are parallelly running throughout the poem. The protagonist of the poem the knight at arms, he is always talking about a beautiful lady who proves to be merciless at the end. When we critically interpret the poem, in fact we found that the lady is nowhere presented to be a merciless, but the title itself is quite apt and suggestive as Kitts has talked about a lady who is beautiful but proves to be merciless at the end. So let us study these three themes in the poem La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. O oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. O oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairest child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long, for sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild and manna dew, and sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, oh, woe betide. The latest dream I ever dreamed, 
on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame sans merci hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning gaped wide, and I awoke and found me here, on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Now we are going to deal with the appreciation of the ballad, La Belle Damsans Mercy. The narrator of the poem, Knight at Arms, is giving an account of his experiences in the meadows. The poet writes, Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sage has withered from the lake and no birds sing. The beginning of the poem is with a question mark. A question is asked to the knight at arms. The questioner founds a knight at arms, palely loitering here and there, quite lonely in the meadows. And the questioner is asking him the reason for loitering here and there, quite alone and palely. See the situation in the surrounding is quite critical. The poet has mentioned, the sage has withered from the lake. If you see the surrounding of the lake, or else sage which is completely withered, that indicates either the autumn season or else the falling time. When we find the falling of the leaves from the trees, almost everything is quite withered. And no birds sing, probably because of all these reasons. The birds have also migrated from one place to the other. In stanza 2, the poet says, Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms? So haggard and so oh begone. Again, the second stanza also opens with a question. The questioner is asking the knight at arms the reasons for his being quite pale, alone, lonely, loitering here and there and expressing his sorrow. So he is trying to find out the various reasons for the sorrow and grief of the knight at arms. He continues, the spirit's granary is full and the harvest is done. See here, some sort of optimism can be found. Unlike the first stanza. In the first stanza, the poet gives us a pessimistic note as no birds sing or as the sage is withered. Conclusion of the second stanza is quite optimistic. The poet talks about the spirit's granary is full. That indicates that the time has brought certain changes in the atmosphere. The spiral has collected a good amount of food for itself. And so the poet says, the spirit's granary is full and the harvest is done. That shows the change in the atmosphere, the change in the weather, the change so far the cycle of nature is concerned that also can be taken into consideration here in this particular stanza. In stanza 3, the poet says, I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist and fewer dew and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast wither it too. In this case, there is no question. The poet straight away explains as if the knight himself is saying something. I see a lily on thy brow. The way the poet has adopted the language is going through a change here. Now we find I, the first person. Here sometimes we, we get baffled whether the questioner is saying this or else the knight at arms is talking about his own experiences. That this I is not going to stand for or it does not stand for the knight at arms. I stands for 
the questioner. The I stands for the narrator of the poem. He asks the knight at arms. He says, I see a lily on thy brow. The flower imagery, the flower, lily is used. It plays the role of a flower imagery in this particular context. He says, I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist and fear dew. That indicates the condition of the knight at arms. As mentioned earlier, he has been loitering here and there for no reason. In fact, it is not conveyed to us what is the purpose of his loitering in the meadows. Now, the poet says, his anguish is quite reflecting so far his physical expressions in this particular expression are concerned. In fact, the flower imagery is always indicated very much positively in all the poems. So far the perception of flower is concerned, especially in the romantic era. Flowers are used as a symbol for happiness, symbol for love and symbol for something optimistic in life. But here, in this particular stanza, probably the poet is giving us a negative sense of the flower imagery. He says, on thy cheeks a fading rose. Here, he is not talking about the rose that always indicates, that always symbolizes love. In this context, he talks about fading rose. Means probably due to the, uh, due to the situation, due to the surrounding, maybe due to the atmospheric effects. And here the poet says, the chicks of the knight at arms, they are compared with the rose and that to a fading rose, not the rose which is quite lively, always symbolizing the love. And here the poet says, and on thy chicks, a fading rose, fast withered too. So that rose is getting withered in the course of time. Probably the time is affecting a lot. The atmosphere is affecting a lot that indicates the situation, that indicates the happenings in the life of the knight at arms. I met a lady in the midst. Now you see, in this particular stanza, I stands for the knight. I stands for the knight at arms. See here what he says, I met a lady in the midst, full beautiful, a fairy child. See the beautiful expression made by the poet with the very simple words that he has used here. I met a lady. This is the declaration of the knight at arms. What he says, I met a lady in the midst. As it is mentioned earlier that the knight at arms is found to be wandering here and there in the meadows. In the same place, in the same meadows, he came across, he encountered a beautiful lady, full beautiful. Probably that is the exaggeration that the poet is trying to make in this kind of expression. He says, full beautiful, a fairy child. In fact, we don't know whether the beautiful lady whom encountered or whom met the knight at arms in the fields, in the mills, whether she is, a, she is an ordinary human being or else a fairy child or else an elfin child. So that has to be pointed out again once we come down for the critical interpretation. Then he continues, her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. See the description of the lady. As mentioned, she is full beautiful, excessively beautiful, exceptionally well. So far, her complexion is concerned. So he adds on to the expression, he adds on to the description of the beauty of the lady. We cannot say that the lady is having a wild eyes. She may have the eyes like a deer. She may have eyes like a lotus. Such kind of comparisons are found. But we hardly see that somebody says that a lady is having the eyes which are wild. But in this expression, the poet is making uh, such things. In the following stanza, he says, 
I made a garland for her head and bracelets too and fragrant zone. This stanza is also narrated, is also conveyed to us through the mouth of knight at arms. Compared to the previous stanza, the flower imagery which is used here seems to be quite positive because flowers always indicate first the love, second the fragrance. They are known for its fragrance. Whenever you see a belt of uh, flowers, the plants of flowers, you always remember that is nothing but a fragrant zone, the zone of fragrance. And we always prefer to walk through the zones of this kind. And so the poet says, the knight at arms has offered her garlands. He has also offered a garland to her head. They have wandered there in the fragrant zone. He continues, she looked at me as she did love. See here, the poet is trying to convey us the assumptions of the knight at arms. Probably it is the assumption of the knight at arms that the lady loves him. In fact, it is no way made clear by the poet whether they are falling in love with each other or else it is just a one side love as we talked about the thematic concerns of the poem. He says, she looked at me as she did love, but there is no confirmation that they are in love for each other. There is no confirmation at all. And he says, and made a sweet moan. I set her on my pacing stead, and nothing else saw all day long. See how beautifully the poet has promoted the idea. He says, on the behalf of the knight, the knight has taken her away. The knight was wandering here and there with the lady in the meadows and, and he set her on his pacing stick. He set her on his horse and both were wandering almost throughout the day in the meadows. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. See the beautiful expression made again in this stanza. When they were wandering in the meadows, they were trying to understand each other. A mutual understanding was taking place. And in the course of wandering in the meadows, she also sang a couple of songs for him, which were very much melodious. The poet continues in the following stanza. She found me roots of frailest sweet, and honey wild and manna dew, and sure in language strange, she said, I love thee true. See here, how fantastically the things are brought together. Here, the knight at arms is trying to convince us that they were in love. They were in love quite deeply. And so he says, after wandering for a long period of time, they felt exhausted and they had some roots they enjoyed in each other's company. She also offered honey wild and manna dew also. As far as these offerings are concerned, we, we, we just think whether are these the food habits of the ordinary human beings. Manadu here indicates the heavenly food, the food which is generally offered in the heaven to the gods and goddesses. So how is it really possible that a fairy child is also having the manadu or the heavenly food and that she is going to offer to the knight at arms? Later, he says, and sure in language strange, it means she is speaking to the knight in a language which is not known to the knight. If it is the case, how is it possible that they have a good communication between them? As earlier the knight at arms said that she loves him true. When he is unable to understand the language of the counterpart, 
how can the knight at arms comes to a conclusion that she loves him true so here is a contradiction and we find no answer throughout the poem in the subsequent stanza he says she took me to her elfin grot and there she wept and sighed full sore and there i shut her wild wild eyes with kisses four in one stanza the poet gives us a negative sense and immediately sometimes in the following stanza he talks about something very positive here he says the lady took the knight at arms to her elfin grot and in that elfin grotto she kept on weeping for long she expressed her sorrow and just to convince her just to console her the knight at arms shut her wild wild eyes and kissed her for four times then in the following stanza he says and there she lulled me asleep see here how the contradiction is in the previous stanza the poet says she was weeping probably no reason is really given here in the poem what is the reason that a lady is crying there what is the reason that the lady is in distress as we have seen since beginning that we have seen knight at arms in a troubleful condition we have seen knight at arms in trouble but when they reached to the elfin grot what exactly happened that she started weeping and here the knight at arms is going to convince her so that is nowhere answered in this particular poem so here he says and there she lulled me asleep in fact he was trying to convince her he was trying to console her but a contradiction takes place in the very immediate stanza here she is singing a beautiful song she is singing a melodious song and he is asleep over there what happens then in the course of time and there she lulled me asleep is he a child that somebody sings a lullaby that is not the case here as he as the poet uses this word lulled he says and there she lulled me asleep and there i dreamt a woe betide the latest dream i ever dreamt on the cold hill side what happens then once he is sleeping over there for some time and the moment he got up he felt that he had a dream very much recently and something is going to happen in his life this is the distressful situation that he ever encountered in the following stanza i saw pale kings and princes too pale warriors death fell where they all they cried la belle dame sans merci the heart in thrall what does it indicate at one moment she was crying and he was trying to convince her second moment he is he is shown to be sleeping in the third moment that he had a bad dream ever and now in the dream he saw that the kings princes warriors they are in thrall and all were crying in the dream the lady is beautiful no doubt but she is merciless as they were making lot of noise collectively they were saying la belle dame sans merci i saw their star lips in the gloom with horrid warning gaped wide and i awoke and found me here on the cold hill side see the situation whatever dream he had that was really horrible that made the knight at arms very much anxious and uneasy he could not compose himself even for a short period of time he realized that he is there quite all all alone in the hill side and he is already deserted by the beautiful lady she is not found around him 
he is all all alone there in the meadows and loitering here and there in the hillside in the last stanza the poet says and this is why i sojourn here alone and palely loitering though the sage is withered from the lake and no birds sing the ending of the poem is quite suggestive and apt that that tells us the final condition of the knight at arms since the beginning he has been telling us various situations and experiences of his life but now he is clearly telling us that he is one of the victims of the beautiful lady who has kept kings princes warriors in thrall and this knight at arms is also one of them in fact the grass is withered over there there is no sign of any life and there are no birds found making musical tunes so they have also migrated from this place and he is the only person who is loitering here and there in the meadows quite lonely as we started a discussion in the beginning that the poem has three different themes which are running throughout the poem quite parallelly theme 1 unreciprocated love theme 2 impossible love and theme 3 incurable illness as far as theme 1 is concerned we come to a conclusion that there is no love affair between the beautiful lady and the knight at arms whatever feelings the knight at arms has probably the similar kind of feeling is not there in the mind of the beautiful lady and that's why he became the victim just one of the victims as the lady has kept so many warriors so many kings and princes in thrall so knight at arms is also one of them and that is why he is just loitering here and there in the meadows lonely so far theme 2 is concerned as it is said impossible love if you interpret the poem with some logical aspects like the beautiful lady is called as an elfin she is called a fairy child so basically there cannot be a relationship between the human beings and the supernatural elements once the knight at arms told us that she is a fairy child so it is impossible to have any relationship between the elfin child and the human being that's why we can conclude that there cannot be any love relationship between the supernatural elements and the human beings now theme 3 incurable illness here the poet is trying to convey us through this knight at arms that his incurable disease is also presented in the form of the knight and his critical situation throughout when we go through the biographical sketch of john kitt's life we find that he was suffering with an incurable disease his brother tom passed away because of tuberculosis the same illness he was also affected by and he was on the verge of death when he composed this poem probably through the condition of the knight at arms who is palely and alone loitering in the meadows that indicates that the poet is trying to present the poet is trying to portray his own life in the form of a knight who is loitering here and there in the meadows with no objective as such <laughs>